Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Um, by the way, DS stands for Defense in Space, so just in case that uh, was left open. Um, when, when asked the question, what are the, the biggest challenges uh, and opportunities? I mean, there's so many challenges currently. Everybody could probably rattle down a whole list of challenges, but I would say maybe the underlying challenge that I see is geopolitics. Um, I think we are at the beginning of a new world order. Um, that world order obviously is very much defined by the conflict or the competition, the rivalry between the US and China. And you have, and that's also an evolving trend, you have um, almost like in the US, swing states globally, states that don't belong to any one camp that sit on the fence and draw power and get attention from that sitting on the fence. I think India would belong to that, uh, South Africa, um, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, maybe some others. Um, those countries are becoming middle powers. They, they, they start to define what's happening in the global world order uh, or co-define. Um, and I think maybe as opposed to a couple of years ago, I think geopolitics is having more influence on the economy than the other way around. That used to be different. We used to think that through trade and through doing good business on the globe, we can shape and give a direction to geopolitics. I think that order has been reversed. Um, and I think that is a huge challenge because many, of, many companies still rely largely on the old world order in terms of free and open trade and, and, and uh, having a large exposure, for instance, in China, um, and have not fully, on the one hand, recovered from COVID, and now this new challenge is thrown at them. And that, I think, uh, leads then to many knock-on effects. Um, we have a war in Europe. We have a, a whole lot of conflict around Europe. All of North Africa is essentially currently uh, contested ground. Uh, we have other regions in the world where we have conflict. And I think even after some time when the, when the war that Russia inflicted on Ukraine um, will be maybe not a hot war anymore, I don't think conflict will go away. Conflict will take many shapes and forms, hybrid, blurred, cyber, social media, everything else. Um, and that is also a part of this new world order that companies need to get ready for. Um, Europe in that world order is currently trying to find its place. I represent a, a European-based company. Uh, so that is something that, that adds another notch or another, let's say, dimension of, of, of difficulty on top of this. So I think coming back to my initial statement, the world order is currently the, the most defining uh, element of, of, of the challenges. At the same time, that also poses uh, opportunities for companies like mine. Um, defense and space companies are benefiting from that as um, as companies try to secure themselves, as companies try to secure their place in this new world order, um, and we're seeing that uptake already in, in, in many parts of the world, uh, definitely also in, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Um, and coming maybe to your second question of what is the largest, what is the biggest task in that? And I would say to, to navigate as a company from this old place that we were in with our companies to the new, uh, to the new position in, in tackling all these difficulties that companies still have in, 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 uh, in positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis China, what policy of, of, of de-risking, decoupling, whatever is appropriate for what company while at the same time not killing your old business, but not denying that everything is in flux, everything's changing, and if you're a little bit too slow, chances are you're gonna get left behind. Uh, so maybe not a new dilemma or new, new challenge, but, but this is clearly a time of massive change, and, 
the old success will not be the new success. And, and if you fall victim to the innovator's dilemma, chances are you're not going to be where you want to be in the future. I think that, that would be my view of it. I have been in Korea for many, many, many years. I've had business in Korea for many, many years. And uh, I'm originally coming from Norway, but also I'm living in France and other places of the world. And one of my, my heart is deeply rooted uh, in Korea since the end of the uh, Korean War in 1953. And I have a lot to do with big companies in uh, Korea like Hyundai and like Samsung. And uh, we are building very many ships because we own uh, tanker ships, big tankers. They are about 300 meters long and they carry commodities and oil all over the world in all countries uh, of the world. And uh, what we see at this time, I believe, from my perspective, and my company, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and I founded the company um, many years ago, and uh, I and my family, we are the biggest shareholder group in the company. What we do see now is a fight between democracy, democracies and totalitarian regimes. Mm. That is the, uh, the, the big fight. And um, I venture to suggest that uh, uh, Russia, they did expect that the NATO alliance would diverge and go in different directions. But in my judgment, what has happened is really NATO and the countries of NATO are coming close together. And the main thing is the uh, collision between the democratic world and the totalitarian world. In my group, we carry oil all over the world. We have not carried Russian oil for almost two years when we stopped carrying oil. We were invited to go into Russia on many occasions, but I said, definitely no, that's not for us. We, we, we have had some business on the eastern coast, in Vladivostok, on the eastern coast, going over, our ships going over to the U.S. west coast. But uh, again, what they do see now is a collision between democracy and totalitarian regimes. That is the main theme we are up against. And uh, we, as Winston Churchill said, we good people must hang together, otherwise we will be hanged separately. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very wise uh, uh, expression by Winston Churchill. And uh, except for that, I would be Please to respond to any questions you have. As I said earlier, we in my company are dealing with big oil, as I call them, Shell, BP, Total, and the big oil companies. And uh, they account for more than 50% of our business. And they lease our ships. And uh, we try to be as reliable as we can and as transparent as we can. When we are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, everything about our company is known, and we are an extremely transparent company. But uh, again, I uh, would like to respond to any questions mm -hmm. the audience may have, and I don't know if I used my time or not, but I feel this is the start of my contribution. Great. Um, so I couldn't agree more with my fellow panelists here on, you know, the, the probably the biggest um, threat and change that we're experiencing is the geopolitical issues, um, you know, U.S.-China relations, obviously, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. As an investment firm, our job is to think through 
um, change, volatility, and find investment opportunities uh, where we can. And so I kind of think of four big themes that we're focused on. The first on the geopolitical side from an investment standpoint is there has been a, and, and you hear about it here, the GVC, the, I think it's global value chain. Um, and the issue is, is that post COVID and because of the geopolitical issues, people are rethinking their suppliers. And it's in three categories. It's China plus one. Uh, you know, post COVID, nobody wants to rely just on China, uh, but they're not leaving China. Second, it's uh, friend shoring. If you're in defense, you want to make sure that your supplier is falling in a line with, this, uh, with the allies as you see this divergence. And then near shoring. Uh, and then also bringing it back home. So there's a lot, you know, in, in Korea, the, the uh, K-CHIP Act, where there's a recognition that for critical components on your marquee companies, to the extent that you can bring back the supply chain, uh, you're seeing the manufacturing and, and, and a real push to that. And so that's having an impact on markets, countries that you invest in. You know, the, the beneficiaries we've seen are India, um, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, um, you know, Brazil, actually, uh, Mexico from a nearshoring. So there's a lot of uh, interesting opportunities in there, but it's also got its threats. So you have to be careful in how you think about it. Um, second category, I would say, is climate change and just climate transition. Uh, countries that represent 90% of the world's GDP, I talked about this earlier, uh, have committed to net zero carbon emissions. Uh, that's going to take a lot of money to be able to actually achieve a lot of investment capital. The question is, where is it coming from? It's probably going to be public-private partnerships. Uh, and so thinking through that from both you know, who, who's manufacturing as well as who's supplying the raw materials and which economies are going to benefit there. Uh, I would say the, uh, the, the third category is tech disruption. Uh, and if you think about things like AI, uh, you know, there's, there's so much noise about the fear of what happens with AI. And, you know, we're at this, this moment with ChatGPT where it's given us a, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's like the internet browser where suddenly everybody realizes what this can do. And there's a lot of people afraid about losing their job. And, um, and yet there's a, there's a massive amount of investment opportunity uh, in, in the, the, the companies that affect things like cyber, uh, the companies that are uh, doing cloud storage, the technology, as well as enhancing what they do. And I'm just a big believer that actually the opportunity will be the creativity that comes from leveraging the capability of, of these technology advances. I think medicine is going to be another great winner. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the final category I would say that people are thinking about and we're thinking about is just interest rates and inflation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think the good news is we're towards the end of the cycle on the Fed increasing. Maybe there's one more in there. But the question is whether inflation remains for a much longer period of time. And honestly, whether or not that starts, you know, the companies who are trying to sustain and carry debt, uh, there's, I read the statistic that said the number of MSCI US companies that are zombie companies, so that means that they, their cost of carrying their debt is greater than their operating profit has gone from something like 13% to 19%. Well, that's just gonna keep getting worse if you don't see ultimately a rate cut in, in say 2024. And, you know, right now, I don't think it's, the data is necessarily clear uh, on that. Uh, and then the other side of it is just, there, there, you know, with the banking crisis, there's a retreatment in capital and lending. And so, you know, U.S. companies, 77% of small businesses now say they're worried that they can't get capital. That is a complete 180 flip from a year ago where 77% believe they had no problem getting capital. And so you think about that on the threat side with rates being higher and lenders retreating that we actually could push economies like the U.S. and others into, um, you know, a, a, a harder landing than I think I hope we're going to see right now. So I think those are kind of the four big themes that we're, we're thinking about and focused on. Um, how do I add to 
the three of you. The, I, I agree with everything you've said. Um, let me start by saying that, you know, my perspective is primarily U.S.-based. I run a U.S. Um, investment banking firm, and so uh, while we have operations also in Europe, uh, my perspective is, is really um, from sitting in the United States. Um, and I would agree that uh, geopolitics is, uh, is, is the biggest issue. I might just point it in a different direction by uh, looking at what we're doing in the U.S. regarding what I believe is a major, major trend in the world economy, and that is simply deglobalization um, and, and the uh, populism that, uh, that is occurring in many countries mm -hmm. that will create both a challenge and an opportunity as we rethink um, globalization that, that has really been the dominant feature in the world economy since Bretton Woods. And, and uh, what, when you see the way tax policy and public policy in the United States is, is pointing toward um, not a global economy, but, but an economy that has more goods you know, produced in the United States, I think that, that that's a major challenge uh, mm -hmm. across the world. You know, and it's, it's interesting as I've, I've visited, and, and thank you for having me here. Uh, it's only my second time here uh, in Korea, and, I've, and I'm really enjoying it. But as I've talked to many of you in my few days here, it seems that, that this country uh, is, is, is looking at uh, sort of the same choices as it relates to geopolitics. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, you export, what, 30% of your exports are to China, mm -hmm. yet, um, so on one hand, um, it's, it's uh, relationships with China, and on the other hand, um, relationships with the United States and Japan. And I think that those aren't always uh, consistent and, uh, and creates, um, you know, challenges. So I think you can just look at your own economy here and see some of the challenges on the geopolitical side. As it relates to risks, and uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts here, you're shipping that, but I see as a huge tail risk to 2024 is an oil shock mm -hmm. um, and, and what can happen to oil mm -hmm. uh, given the, the tensions in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, when you combine what is going on with OPEC or what Russia can do on the supply side for oil, um, I, I don't hear a lot about people talking about what happens if oil um, you know, goes up 20% and what that means to the world economy. I think that that's a risk that, um, that is real and it's uh, and never underestimate what some uh, regimes will do to influence, influence U.S. politics. And uh, so I, I think that uh, that is a risk for, for 2024. As it relates to overall businesses, certainly we see it, Jenny mentioned this, um, in the United States, and that is many companies and the economy in general has to re-rate its entire business model to a risk-free rate that will settle you know, somewhere between, I think, three and could be six percent. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, um, I, I don't, I, w I would agree that the consensus may be one more rate increase. I will say from my perspective, I've, uh, I've been on uh, some of the advisory boards in the Fed on U.S. policy. I will say in general that the U.S. policymakers at the Fed will err on the side of containing inflation more than they will on stimulating the economy. And therefore, um, the risk that rates are higher for longer as compared to the forward interest rate curve is a real risk that needs to be put into the equation. But as important is what Jenny said, I, I look at a number of private companies that um, have their day of reckoning um, delayed primarily because they're private. Um, and, they're, and they're not necessarily dealing with the fact that their business models don't even 
carry their cost of debt capital. So overall, those, those are uh, risks, but with every risk, obviously, is opportunity. And uh, the, uh, the, the firms that uh, recognize uh, the fact that overall, uh, world economic growth will, over the long term, is going to be up. And there's a lot of opportunity. But you'll have to rethink it in terms of, as I said, a less emphasis on, emphasis on globalization. That's certainly true in the United States. Um, higher rates. And then, um, of course, the geopolitical, primarily the tensions between the U.S. and China and how that plays through. Mm -hmm.